are in the room with me. Uh, Céline Quentin is um, a research fellow at CERI Sciences Po and is part of the H2020 Project Magic. Shoshana Kain is a postdoctoral researcher at Hugo Observatory at the University of Liège. Uh, at the CERI Sciences Po and at the German Institute of Global Areas uh, Studies, is also a visiting fellow at ICEVA. Um, Basha Kjavjan is uh, joining us remotely, so she's on Zoom with you. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the Hugo Observatory uh, at the University of Liège. And finally, uh, Pam Pavel Zerka is uh, a policy fellow at ICFA. Um, so the, the pandemic that hit Europe uh, and the rest of the world had, has impacted European uh, migration policies. Uh, and, and, and we have witnessed uh, drastic measures that uh, have been put in place by the EU member states uh, to limit mobility. Uh, so one way after the publication by the European Commission of, uh, of the new pact for migration and asylum, uh, this discussion will touch upon uh, the impact of the health crisis on migration governance uh, from a pattern of selective welcome of certain migrant groups uh, to the management of refugee camps uh, during the crisis. Uh, so, but the panelists here are obviously the experts, so I'm going to uh, leave it to them. Uh, they'll speak for a while and then we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A session and you can obviously raise your hands uh, and we'll give you uh, the floor or you can write your questions in the chat. Uh, so over to you, Shoshana. Okay, thank you very much. And with respect to prices. So basically the main objective of this project uh, is to look at the way a uh, crisis, so a real crisis or an imaginary crisis, you know some people, people spoke about a migration crisis back in 2015 and 16, you know this was very much a contested notion. Uh, other people speak of, spoke about a European crisis, a humanitarian crisis. So this crisis imaginary, contested as it was, you know it has real impact. Uh, on policies. Um, so uh, what we're looking at really is how this crisis imaginary has reconfigured governing practices. Uh, so what kind of effects on uh, the actors, the practices and the policies in European migration governance. Uh, so what does crisis do? So seeing crisis as something that is quite performative, it's not just uh, something that is out there, you know, a context, but actually, um, you know, has agentic force. Um, so crisis is generative of certain kinds of governing interventions and non-interventions. So crisis is implicitly framed as exceptionalism and emergency, and it evokes a one-off catastrophe that requires sacrifices in order to surmount it. Uh, so I think that this uh, notion about what crisis does is extremely relevant when we think about uh, how uh, the COVID sanitary crisis has impacted what we might call migration governance or mobility governance. Uh, so we've seen that one of the main policy responses uh, in the EU and obviously beyond has been restrictions on mobility. Uh, so for the first time in the EU, we've seen restrictions on mobility that we haven't really known since the Second World War. Um, so these restrictions on mobility are affecting populations that are less often affected by restrictions on mobility. So populations that are often not called migrant populations, by the way, so we often don't use this term. The category of migrant is a politicised term uh, that we rarely use, for instance, to speak about uh, cross-border EU migration. <laughs> Uh, my migration is, is often classified uh, differently or categorised differently. So we've seen huge restrictions on mobility, lockdowns, uh, quarantine measures, um, and these are affecting particularly uh, those also refugee categories, vulnerable migrants. So for instance, we've seen in refugee camps, you know, either the whole refugee camp has been quarantined or parts of it. Um, so secondly, another uh, dimension of what crisis does to governing practices is that of it declares an event or phenomenon, uh, declaring it as crisis is a question of moral judgment. So crisis tells the audience that something is not normal and bad. So I think we all kind of agree with this when we're speaking about um, 
uh, the COVID sanitary crisis, whereas this is obviously a bit more questionable when we're speaking about the migration crisis, because as we can see, crisis is performative, it then shapes policies. Uh, thirdly, crisis evokes quick fixes and ad hoc arrangements, which inhibit engagement with structural conditions, treating crisis as a depoliticized phenomenon. And I will come back to this later on how it relates to migration and COVID and the way in which uh, they're being governed together. Um, fourthly, and I think this is an interesting proposition coming from uh, the scholar Anna Lindley, who's based uh, in SOAS, who says that there is a deep well of sedentarist thinking, which in some senses frames migration as crisis and staying put as the natural desirable human condition. So I think that this is something we can see in general. So in the context of the migration crisis, you know, seeing that very the act of migrating as a crisis in itself, but obviously this is something that we can very much see uh, with the ways in which COVID has been managed, in which mobility has been highly securitized. So not just affecting those categories of people labeled as migrants, but really something that's much more widespread. Um, so mobility is being seen today as inherently dangerous. So not just cross border mobility, but also within a national border. Um, so while in the past, you know, some forms of mobility have been securitized, other forms of mobility have really been uh, considered as desirable. So if we look at the way that the EU bordering practices work, they work as a filter, so rather than a wall, so to speak. So we see lots of different mechanisms to stop what's seen as undesirable and unwanted migration, and alternative mechanisms that try to foster or enhance what's seen as good mobility. Uh, so often, for instance, you know, migration within the EU space, uh, tourism, uh, mobility for businesses, um, so in the context of COVID, as I said, we can say to some extent, all forms of mobility have been securitized. We are all potentially dangerous. Um, but that said, this filtering mechanism is still present. So some forms of mobility seem to be more dangerous than others. So how are these divisions manifest? Um, so I think it's quite interesting that we're in a situation today where the Schengen border and the US border are still close to each other. Uh, so this is, this is extremely rare. Uh, so the border is actually open for citizens and long-term residents, but you know it's closed to, to, to the masses, so closed to tourism, closed to other forms of migration. Um, and what I found quite interesting was that, and this is no longer the case, but towards the beginning of the COVID crisis, the US border was open. However, it put in place a situation of quarantine for two weeks for non-citizens. Uh, so from a public health perspective, you know, this doesn't make much sense, or we can argue it. So there's obviously symbolic dimension to these practices that conceive of foreign populations as inherently more dangerous, so that they'll more probably carry us of the virus. I know that this is something that Celine is going to mention later. Uh, so this really recalls me uh, in the literature, Peter Andreas speaks of a concept of a border security, by which he means border control efforts are not only actions, but also gestures that communicate meaning. Uh, so I think you can see here also some dimensions of the border spectacle in that obviously it doesn't make any sense that non-citizens should be more dangerous than citizens. Uh, the policies have changed since then, but, but this was certainly the case at the beginning of the crisis. Um, so interestingly, the, while the European border remains closed to countries like Turkey and, and other countries, this is not always reciprocal. reciprocal. And so what we can see here, I think, in this instance and in others, is that COVID migration and governance also follows patterns of, quote unquote, normal migration governance. So obviously, uh, so what we see here is that Turkish citizens uh, can't come to the EU, so the borders closed right now. And as you know, before the COVID crisis, we saw that Turkish citizens, it was much more difficult to enter the EU, you needed a visa and so forth, whereas the border remains open uh, for EU citizens the other way. So it's interesting to see you know, how much this question of the COVID crisis has actually uh, changed or not uh, migration governance. Uh, so if the health crisis has momentarily modified the modalities of European border control, the essence of its rationality based on the protection of population from northern countries vis-a-vis -vis the south remains largely intact. Um, so these restrictions are first part of a logic of protection of some lives, so particularly European citizens, and then less part of this kind of logic of state sovereignty, uh, security, economic or identity, often associated with a fantasized cultural incompatibility, which is often at the heart of many migration policies. Um, so we see, for instance, policies put in place to protect European citizens. We saw countries like Germany, Britain, France invest huge amounts of money in repatriation flights. So when COVID first kicked off, so bringing people back to their home countries, there was very much this notion that 
they would be endangering foreign lands that were better off at home. So we see once again the sedentary bias kicking in there. Um, and this logic of protecting the lives of Europeans is also manifest in the reconfiguration of the categories of migrants who are considered as useful. Uh, so we see, for instance, the making of a new desirable migrant based on uh, different kinds of criteria that fit in with this kind of sanitary crisis. So, for instance, the United States has lifted visa restrictions for foreign health professionals. Um, uh, in the UK, Spain and Germany have accelerated processes for the recognition of foreign diplomas for professions in the medical centre. Uh, to, to put in place policies to mobilize migrant doctors. So here we see some examples of ad hoc arrangements, extending rights of a particular kind of migrant in the name to responding to an emergency to bring us back to this relationship between crisis and governing interventions. But we can also see in the agricultural sector, so countries like Germany, uh, the UK and the Netherlands have also called on migrants to work in, for instance, strawberry and farrows. Uh, we see today that one of the migrant groups is exempt from quarantine in the UK is that of seasonal workers uh, in working in the agricultural sector. So once again, we can see this as part of you know, nourishing European populations, as part of this protection, uh, it, new kind of imaginary that, that has become part of the migration policies today. Um, so just a quick brief, I think I've spoken enough, so just to, to recap on what I've said. So, COVID migration and migration governance, thinking about the relationships here. So we see new examples, new articulations of deserving and undeserving migrants articulated around public health. Uh, we see a somewhat generalization of the securitization of mobility. So I would say not just securitization of migration, but mobility. Although we still see that some groups are held to be more dangerous than others. So we can still see a kind of hierarchization process going on here. And we really see a growth in emergency and ad hoc responses, which both exclude and support some types of migrants to hope to halt the diseases. So we see, for instance, exclusion through the complete stopping of res the resettlement of refugees, uh, to give you one example. And we see the inclusion, as I mentioned, some forms of labour migrants who wouldn't necessarily in the past had access to legal pathways of migrants, so particularly doctors, people working in the medical realm and agricultural sector. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, maybe Celine, you can. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks, Roshana, for your talk. So I just tried to pick up a little bit this idea that at least in the course of the pandemic, we saw this magnification of lockdowns and confinement measures which led to this sort of regimes of differentiated mobility based on the needs emerging from the new moral and political economic landscape brought about by um, COVID-related circumstances. So this idea that there was a, a sort of um, new regime of valuation based on migrants' ability to contribute to the preservation of uh, European life through their work in uh, care, agriculture, for instance, is actually, a, I think, an interesting reconfiguration of um, migration governance rationals. But in a broader sense, as, uh, as uh, Shoshana also mentioned, the situation was broadly characterized by a quite um, unprecedented closure of borders, uh, which also targeted migrants or those uh, trying to reach Europe for the purpose of uh, claiming asylum, for instance, in, in specific ways. So we saw the suspension of asylum procedures, increasing difficulties for people to to travel and for those who managed to reach the shores of the EU or the borders of the EU to uh, to be uh, allowed onto territories. So I just zoom a little bit more into this measure now to discuss the way in which the COVID crisis has been mobilized towards the stabilization of this exclusionary regime of border and migration governance. Um, as always, in spite of increased uh, restrictions, mobilities did not fully really stop. So people kept traveling and embarking on journeys, which were made uh, often considerably more dangerous because of additional uh, security oriented measures. Uh, but we did witness, especially in March and April, uh, a drop in arrivals and the final claims at the border of the, of the EU. Uh, not only because of border related measures, but also because of the final measures in uh, states from which migrants would context a number of um, mobility related measures specifically targeting those people migrants were deployed so 
Uh, we saw a number of EU member states closing their ports to migrants' arrival, although those ports would still function, in fact, for other types of mobilities or circulation. So, more specifically, the Italian and Maltese authorities closed their ports officially in early April to, to migrants' uh, arrival, so to the boats carrying migrants. Um, we also saw an interesting uh, criminalization of helpers or transporters, which again is far from a, a new process, but it was perhaps particularly interesting how it played out in that particular context with, for instance, uh, for instance, a tanker boat, uh, Mars, a Danish um, boat, being asked by Maltese authority to take on board some rescued uh, migrants and then being denied access to the port uh, in Malta because it was carrying uh, people. And in fact, being left at sea for several uh, days, 40 days, suffering economic loss losses and being spectacularized, I think, as a means of deterrence uh, regarding uh, basically rescuing, rescuing people at sea in a context with, where because of the pandemics, a lot of the search and rescue operation had been interrupted. And eventually, uh, the people who'd been uh, boarded on this ship were placed onto civil society boats where they were quarantined. And as Shoshana said, that was also another measure that was introduced, especially for her sea arrival, which was the quarantining of uh, migrant arrivals. Uh, often, again, on civil society boats that were independently chartered uh, through various financial means, not by states or the EU. Um, We've also seen the increase, or at least the continuation, of practices of uh, deportation and quick return at the border, so fast track deportation. Um, and basically, all these measures were, in that particular context, very much presented as responses to a crisis that uh, brought about by the COVID 19 virus, and, and as sort of a, a series of exceptional responses in order to, to bring back to normal an abnormal situation. In reality, if we look at the history of uh, European uh, migration governance, none of those are new. We can record practices of quarantining migrants in the early 2000s, uh, practices of border detention and fast deportation that have actually very much routinized in a number of EU member states. And similarly, similarly this sort of criminalization or disqualification of people who transport migrants is also a well known phenomenon with the criminalization of various solidarity initiatives. So as Shoshana was mentioning earlier, and as we sort of study in, um, in the H2020 Project Magic, there has been uh, this strong tendency to govern migration as a crisis or, or as a series of crises, which has led to processes of nationalization and normalization of very brutal and often uh, exclusionary um, uh, policies towards migrants. Um, so what's perhaps uh, interesting and new here is the way in which this migration crisis nexus or discourse is mediated through this uh, idea of a sanitary uh, issue. And I just discussed very quickly this idea of migrants as a biological threat, which uh, sort of emerged more strongly in the particular context um, of the COVID-19 crisis. So, for instance, after the disembarking um, of migrants in Sicily, which were rescued, as I mentioned, uh, on a civil society boat, uh, Matteo Salvini, the former Italian uh, uh, Minister of the Interior, Minister of the Interior, called for the resignation of the Italian Prime Minister uh, under the pretext that he was unable to protect the Italian population in a biological sense. So we're not speaking about a cultural or social threat, which is a sort of more mainstream discourse that we often hear about migration, but really about protection of life, which also links in with what Shoshana was saying. So uh, the rhetoric around the, the sanitary crisis and the health threats was very much transported into the bodies of people constructed as others. And there was processes of exteriorization of uh, the pandemic. Uh, we've also seen processes of racialization or othering of the virus. We all remember uh, American President Trump speaking about the Chinese virus or the foreign virus. So again, as was mentioned with, with, uh, by Shoshana, this idea that it's something that comes from the outside and that's imported uh, through migrants, in that case, with their very bodies, and that requires a number of security measures in order to be stopped. But as we know, those are long-standing uh, political agendas and exclusionary agenda. For instance, the association between migrants and diseases uh, is not new in Trump's uh, rhetoric. And he was already using such uh, association in 2015 during his uh, presidential campaign. 
uh, portraying Mexican migrants as uh, carrier of infectious diseases, predators, and so on and so forth. But in fact, even if we look further back in time, this accusation that migrants import bacteria, viruses, and diseases, and therefore endanger the lives of natives, is far from new. Uh, we can look back at some of the first international conferences on global health, which were in fact motivated uh, by uh, the need to deal with various epidemics, such as the cholera epidemics of the mid-19th centuries, in which the colonial power of the time, the British, French, Dutch, also the Ottoman Empire, um, discussed the way in which new governance measures could be placed on mobilities in order to contain as far away as possible from their own territories, but was seen as an external measure. Of course, this type of measure systematically fails, and uh, because of uh, the way pandemic usually uh, circulates, uh, that was never actually a, an appropriate response. Um, there's a very interesting um, uh, article by French researcher Pete Banis about uh, the way in which France and Italy dealt with the cholera epidemic in the 1880s. And he describes what he calls in that article of hunts against foreigners and the way in which uh, border procedures of quarantining, of filtering, of uh, checking uh, the health and, and, uh, and, the, and the sanitary conditions of people were implemented at the French Italian border in ways which didn't stop actually the spread of this cholera pandemic, but which reinforced uh, nationalist discourses about territorial integrity and uh, various forms of uh, racist and ideologically uh, exclusionary discourses. So there's a whole history of this relation between uh, the management of pandemics or health crisis and bordering practices. And that's something we, Shoshana and I, are also interested in further investigating. I think we could really bring out a record and perhaps a genealogy of how such approaches have informed uh, how we think about both health and, and, uh, and mobilities. Um, another way in which that particular um, that particular discourse works in times uh, of uh, health crisis is with this idea that migrants are placing a burden on the health systems and public services of uh, these. So perhaps in pandemics, even more than ever, there is this, there has been this insistence on the shortage of resources uh, and this idea that there the are limited healthcare capacities and therefore migrants should not be uh, included, received, and cared for uh, through public health system. And so to come back to what you were saying, Matthew, in the introduction, we have seen uh, processes of exclusion of migrants from social services through uh, them being denied, denied access to judicial, judicial procedures, such as the asylum, but also through their exclusion of uh, healthcare systems, through their best quarantining in, uh, in camps, as has happened in Greece, for instance, but also in uh, countries in the Balkans, in Serbia, all detention facilities were mass quarantine for several months. And we see that this is actually based on racializing discourses and practices that do not only target migrants, but also other social groups, domestic groups seen as dangerous and undesirable. And for instance, we've seen the, the quarantining, quarantining of uh, Roma settlements in a number of Eastern uh, European countries. Uh, do I still have a minute? Or? Yeah, yeah, I have one minute. <laughs> okay, so basically what we've sketched here, I, I, I think with Shoshana, is was kind of the emergence of two particular regimes of, of mobility governance under conditions of a house crisis. One that uh, filters people based on their ability to protect European populations, and another, base, another one based more generally on the exclusion of all migrants seen as biological threat uh, that uh, that's put at risk the national or the European body. And we also saw in some countries uh, a sort of third, a third response emerging, also quite punctually. Uh, for instance, in Portugal, we saw the temporary regularization of all uh, foreign residents in the aim of giving them access to health services. In Italy as well, there were a number of measures taken towards undocumented migrant labor uh, so that they would access healthcare and that they would be able to work in uh, temporary legalized conditions. So, of course, we can uh, you know, question the sort of rationale behind those. Uh, is it because, as Shoshana was also mentioning, the need for migrant labor was increased? 
or is there a humanitarian logic of protection of the more vulnerable? Or could it be this uh, sort of precedence of an idea that uh, in such situation, the sort of health of each or the health of all depends on the health of each? And that by uh, extending treatment and care to all, we can also protect the sort of collective community better. And again, if we look at history, we've seen that at times such readings of uh, social communities did prevail. For example, it was very much based on the idea that uh, pandemics and sicknesses were uh, developing very fast in, in salubrious conditions, that the number of public intervention to, to improve the working life, the life of working class communities uh, were put forward by doctors and then carried over by authorities in the 19th century. So, although we see at the moment a mix of rationals between you know, exclusionary features, which, as I said, predate uh, the pandemics and the consolidation of particular mobility regime uh, that tend to exclude migrants, we also see the emergence at time and in places of more universalist ideas about the right to health care uh, and the idea that our sort of individual and collective health are connected. So I guess I'd like to just finish on the call for taking this particular proposal seriously. Thanks. Um, now over to Bashak, if, uh, if she can unmute herself and, uh, and give, her, give us her presentation. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, happy to join you, even if it is virtually. Um, so I'll, today I'll talk about the, um, the Turkish case, the refugees in Turkey, the EU-Turkey deal, um, and possible ways to revisit it. Um, also mentioned, as also mentioned by other speakers, COVID-19 has adversely impacted the well-being of people in every corner of the world, especially those at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, and that also includes the um, uh, refugees. Turkey, with more than currently 3,700, 317,000 reported cases uh, has fortunately managed to avoid the spike in the number of COVID deaths, but still uh, we're going through the second wave to, uh, and it is too early to talk. Um, the government does not provide separate statistics for the number of refugees that have contracted COVID, but densely populated urban settings with high rates of infection are also where most Syrians live. Uh, it is widely recognized that the pandemic has significantly disrupted the lives of nearly 4 million refugees in the country and is exacerbating their ability to meet their basic needs and access to livelihood opportunities. Uh, considering the possible toll of the pandemic on uh, the host country's economy, it is likely to get worse. So today I'll argue that there is now an opportunity to moderate the worst effects of the pandemic by revisiting and revamping the EU-Turkey statement of March, 19, uh, March 2016 in the spirit of the Global Compact of, on Refugees that both in Turkey and all EU member states except Hungary is a signatory of. In doing this, I'll remind us briefly what the deal was about and what worked and what did not, and also the developments at the Turkish-Greek border right before the outbreak of the pandemic in Europe. I will then address, assess how refugees in Turkey have been affected by the pandemic uh, in relation to their access to rights um, and livelihoods, uh, leading us into why and how the deal can be uh, revisited. So. Uh, the primary, going back to the March 2016 deal, the deal, <laughs> the primary objective was to curb the sudden surge in the number of irregular crossings into Greece from Turkey, uh, which peaked during the summer fall of 2015, and it sought to achieve this by increasing Turkish border security and allowing Greece to return all new irregular migrants to Turkey. In return, Turkey was promised two tranches of 3 billion euro in, euros in grants to meet some of the costs of supporting refugees, but also enhancing border security. Additionally, to encourage regularized paths to asylum, the deal envisaged the resettlement of one registered asylum seeker for Turkey for each irregular migrant return to Turkey. Finally, Turkey's EU accession process was also to be re-energized through a visa liberalization program and uh, a new chapter in the membership negotiation process was to be opened. So let's see what happened, what did happen in terms of the promises that has been made and what didn't. The deal was 
definitely effective in terms of improving EU's border security concerns and sharing some of Turkey's war burden in meeting the needs of refugees. The number of illegal crossings have uh, dropped dramatically from 1,800 tons in 2015 to uh, 40,000 stay in 2017. And um, the officials from both sides were able to put in place a working relationship through the creation of the facility for refugees in Turkey, uh, where the funds were uh, distributed. Uh, and uh, for instance, they gave direct financial to support to 1.7 million of the most vulnerable refugees, Syrians, and other groups as well, enhancing education facilities and capacity, healthcare, which I'll mention um, more soon, and the livelihoods through the financing of numerous language and uh, vocational training programs. And so far uh, of the 6 billion promised, about 4.7 billion contracted and 3.4 billion dispersed. Despite serving, despite serving the interests of both parties, of course, it was criticized in Europe issues of undermining international refugee law and lack of robust humanitarian focus was an issue also giving too much leverage to the Turkish governments uh, together with the periodic threats from Turkey to open the borders and let refugees stream towards Europe, which did materialize in the end, uh, exacerbated these concerns. Uh, in Turkey, the greatest criticism came from government circles who found the funds uh, were inadequate compared to the public resources uh, allocated, that more funds were necessary close to the, in the border area. And uh, also, um, many of the funds were distributed through UN agencies and NGOs rather than directly transferring them to state institutions. And at the end, the failed coup attempt of two, July 2016 and the subsequent domestic political developments and democratic backsliding blocked any progress towards visa liberalization and re-energizing of Turkey's accession process. So no progress there. Uh, when we look at right before uh, the uh, outbreak, uh, we have seen that this pragmatic cooperation between Turkey and EU should not be taken for granted. Uh, this is uh, especially important considering how the escalation of the conflict in Idlib in late February created the prospect of an impending mass influx uh, of close to 1 million Syrians in Turkey, which turned uh, which in turn sparked a crisis with the EU following uh, Turkish president's announcement that Turkey would stop controlling outflows from its western borders. As a result, an estimated 12,000 to 25,000 refugees, asylum seekers and migrants from 29 different countries uh, gathered on the border with Greece. Greece responded by closing its borders with strong operational and political support from the EU and suspending asylum applications for several months. Uh, on March 9th, shortly after the crisis began and following a meeting between uh, the President Erdogan and Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in Brussels, both sides reiterated their commitment to the deal and expressed their interest in improving it. Um, shortly after opening its border on 27th of February, Turkey closed its borders with Bulgaria and Greece on the 18th of March. Since then, all migrants have been evacuated from the border area on the Turkish side and were transfer transported to their previous host cities in Turkey following a current time. Those who crossed the Greek border were put in camps and the EU sought to expedite at least the resettlement of unaccompanied minors. And um, Greece halting of asylum for several months, poor conditions in refugee camps and pushbacks, all of which being manifestations of poor capacity on the Greek side made the conditions even harder for those who managed to cross earlier um, than the closing of the border due to COVID. So when we come to the current refugee situation in Turkey uh, in regards to COVID pandemic, according to the latest figure, Syrian, as you know, the Syrian population uh, is about uh, 3.6 million and add to that another 370,000 asylum seekers and refugees from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Somalia and elsewhere. Uh, so it made, all of these make Turkey the largest uh, refugee hosting country in the world right now and uh, the temporary protection status of only Syrians enables them to enjoy some access to free public services, including education and 
uh, healthcare, but their lives are still marked by deep precarity. And the pandemic has uh, increased these vulnerabilities. Um, asylum related procedures following the pandemic were halted except for emergencies until June 1st, uh, with the Directorate for Migration Management of Turkey remaining on a limited functionality. Uh, with regards to the lives of refugees, uh, crowded living quarters, poor sanitary conditions, food insecurity and access to health services uh, were, were uh, definitely important issues. With regards to access to health services, for instance, uh, a study by Assam, the largest NGO in Turkey, um, providing protection to refugees demonstrates that 63 to 50 3% of those surveyed encountered difficulties in reaching food and meeting hygiene conditions, respectively. There is a project uh, also funded by the EU facility called Sihat, which had established 178 migrant health clinics across 29 provinces of Turkey with hundreds of doctors and nurses and midwives. Uh, these centers undertook information dissemination in Arabic regarding COVID, social distance, hygiene, uh, etc. And in order to access these centers though, you need to be registered at where you live, which is not always the case uh, with uh, several places which are have more prospect for employment such as Istanbul, uh, uh, did stop a new registration. So you do find a lot of people, who, a lot of Syrians living there unregistered. Um, so with limited access or no access to uh, these facilities. Luckily, on April 13th, COVID testing and care, uh, care were categorized as emergency health care and free care to be, it was decided free care to be provided to everyone, even without any social security scheme. So free face masks were distributed, uh, but still a study by Asylum Support Foundation illustrates that fears of deportation still, especially when living uh, not registered in the city, uh, in that particular city, eviction or losing one's job still led to hesitation in seeking health care uh, on the side of the refugees during this period. And the picture was uh, even worse for the livelihood opportunities. 69% uh, of refugees have reported a loss of employment, while many Syrian-owned businesses suspended their activities. 20 per, uh, according to TEPAV study, 26% of the surveyed Syrians had gone on an unpaid leave uh, and 12% got laid off and 7% got employed because their business is closed. So to put this number comparatively with Turkish citizens, 50% indicated loss of income with the Turkish citizens and this rate was 88% for Syrians. So uh, as a result, 65% had indicated that they face difficulty pay paying their rents. Same issues were there with regards to access to education due to the limited access to internet and computers. Um, and some of the social aid programs, most of the social aid programs that did cover the citizens uh, during for COVID, that were generated for COVID did not cover refugees as their employment losses are unofficial due to the informal nature, nature of their jobs. During this period, NGOs and municipalities, solidarity networks provided some aid, but this aid was not sustainable and limited in numbers. And the FRIT funds were at this point far from adequate in meeting uh, refugees based economic needs, some of the funds allocated on employability were allowed to be transferred to basic needs and humanitarian aids, uh, but we'll uh, still see uh, what is to come. So when it comes to, again, what does this tell us uh, about the future of the deal, about the new deal, uh, when it comes to how to revamp the deal, let me first address the elephant in the room by stating the obvious first, that it will be challenging given the poor state of the EU-Turkey relations and the tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean. Still, focusing on two elements would make a good start. Firstly, because the COVID pandemic creates a double emergency for refugees and avoiding uh, contracting their virus on the one hand and continuing to gain access to basic needs and livelihoods. On the other, Syrian refugees have seen their uh, vulnerability significantly increase. And with Turkey's own resources, it will be very difficult to meet these needs. And secondly, 
the traditional refugee response system clearly also acknowledged by the um, new uh, EU migration and asylum pact, new proposed pact, uh, based on finding durable solutions, forced displacements through local integration, resettlement and repatriation is broken, and ever-growing number of refugees have found themselves in protracted situations without access to durable situations everywhere and also in Turkey. And that's rec recognizing this, the global compact of refugees, uh, emphasize creating opportunities for enhancing refugee self-reliance and the resilience of host communities. And I think that's also, we thought that this is also a good start. Uh, and uh, we think that one way to achieve this in the Turkish case is for EU to extend preferential trade agreements, especially for goods and sectors with high refugee participation and grant concessions that would enable Turkey to expand its agricultural exports to the EU tied to the formal employment of Syrians in line with the global compact. Um, Turkey already is part of an economically beneficial uh, customs union with the EU since 1995. However, only industrial goods are uh, covered in this uh, arrangement. Uh, so exports of fresh fruits and vegetables together with the agricultural portion of the industrially processed goods both of these areas, by the way, are heavily uh, areas where uh, refugee population is heavily employed in, um, are excluded, uh, and they are taxed. They these areas face regulatory restrictions such as quotas. Uh, so um, this leads to um, loss of welfare on both sides, and uh, both the agricultural sector and industrial sector processing agricultural goods could. Uh, suffer from labor supply shortages. And this shortage is filled by Syrian labor, labor who work under adverse and precarious conditions. And just in the spirit of Compact Jordan, uh, these conditions could be improved. So um, I'm at the end if I took too long. So uh, just uh, I will have a last sentence saying that the benefits of updating the deal are clear uh, as well as the need to do so. I believe all that reminds is the willingness to act and I'm happy to elaborate it further in the Q&A session, maybe in relation to the pact. Uh, I apologize if I took too long. Thank you. Many thanks, Pashak. Uh, we'll come back to you after Pavel's uh, intervention. So please up, uh, come to you, Pavel. Thank you. Um, I think I'll be approaching the subjects from a slightly different angle than, than my colleagues because um, I, I'm not focusing on migration policies, but rather on public opinion. Given uh, that I've been engaged in ECFR's public opinion work with our latest uh, um, public opinion survey in nine EU countries conducted in the end of April this year and focused uh, specifically on how COVID has affected European cooperation. Uh, and here, uh, let me make a short caveat that I, I don't believe that public opinion is necessarily the best guide for, for uh, public uh, policies. Uh, and actually, I, I admire most those politicians like uh, Angela Merkel on a number of occasions who have had the courage to do the right thing, even if the uh, public opinion was not uh, convinced yet. Uh, but at the same time, there are uh, other uh, political leaders who, um, who choose to uh, opportunistically uh, either use the public opinion as a justification for inaction or even worse, they, they use it uh, as a way to consolidate their power um, around negative uh, um, instincts or, or, or emotions. And in this sense, we can no longer pretend that uh, public opinion doesn't uh, matter for, for public uh, uh, policies. It's for me inevitably a part of a context uh, uh, in which uh, the, the uh, battle of narratives is taking place and the shape of, policy, uh, of policies uh, is, is, is also, uh, the policies are, are taking shape. Uh, and then uh, COVID-19 obviously was, was a shock to, to most of us and it could have affected uh, public opinions, uh, uh, preferences and sensitivities. Some of the early hypotheses um, about, about, about the effects of the, of the COVID-19 were 
about, for example, that climate urgency will suddenly uh, become relegated to the second plane, or that the uh, pandemic would become a burden for, uh, for populist leaders and populist parties, or last but not least, that, that migrants might become an easy scapegoat uh, for, given, given the overall anxiety of, uh, uh, of, of the European public. So far, uh, none of this has, has, uh, has materialized, uh, uh, but, I, but I believe that we need to stay vigilant because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, far, far from certain that we won't see some of this uh, uh, happening. And now moving to, the, uh, to our public opinion work, we, we didn't ask specific questions about migration, but we did ask those about borders. And I think uh, that this is important for, for, for our discussions, even if borders and migrants is not necessarily the same uh, uh, thing. And for me, what, what we found in our uh, survey uh, is an example of how data can be a source of both hope and concern. Um, one of the most shocking findings that, that, uh, that we, we've seen and, uh, was that uh, among the European public, there was a massive rise in declared or a massive declared rise in support for stricter border controls, uh, going from almost 50% in Denmark up to over 70% in Portugal. Um, then when we ask more specific questions, whether, uh, questions whether uh, people would like to see more control of either external or internal EU borders, once the coronavirus crisis is over, we, we've seen these numbers uh, getting lower, but not necessarily radically lower for external borders, from for more control of external borders from one third of the population in Italy to over 60% uh, in Portugal and Bulgaria, and almost 50% in France. Um, uh, so this, when I when I saw the, the, those results uh, first, I, I was I was deeply worried. But then I became surprised when we started digging deeper. In one of the biggest crises was the uh, stricter border controls. Also, turned out to be those who uh, who declared a growing support for climate uh, commitments as well as growing support for the respect of rule of law, uh, human rights and democracy. Therefore, there is no competition between those, uh, uh, those areas, but it rather seems that, that uh, simply people who feel vulnerable, they feel vulnerable uh, uh, overall. And therefore, this, this, this rising support for stricter border controls is rather a sign of uh, general fragility and sensitivity to all the uh, other uh, issues and if, if we look for, uh, at this from this perspective, it seems that uh, what the European public is, let's say, telling us through that data is is that they would uh, um, be happy with a Europe that protects the uh, Europe qui uh, protège, whatever that means, and what, rather than uh, necessarily hope for an end of Schengen zone in, inside the European Union, or rather than uh, them becoming necessarily anti-migrant or or xenophobic uh, in a way and for uh, for this we, we can also uh, support this this other observation by the fact that since the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic we haven't seen a rise in support for right-wing populist or, or nationalist uh, leaders uh, in, in, in most uh, EU uh, countries rather it was the other way around in, in Poland in the presidential elections the candidate of the ruling law and justice actually almost lost the presidential election. Then in Italy with Lega or in Sweden with Sweden Democrats, in Spain with the Vox Party or with the polling of, of two uh, uh, right-wing parties in the Netherlands as well as with Marine Le Pen in France, the, their ratings have, have, uh, have decreased since the outbreak, outbreak uh, of the pandemic or at least have not progressed uh, uh, at, at all, which, which shows that it, it has not turned out, at least not as a, as, as a bargain to, for, for nationalist, populist or, uh, or xenophobic uh, leaders. And uh, let, let me move to, 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 the, to the point. Uh, so I, I think that what we 
are seeing and what our uh, findings in, in ECFR's uh, survey uh, co corroborate is that uh, the border issue is getting normalized. So border control is becoming normal, uh, which has uh, presents but as itself both opportunities and risks. And it's uh, because if, since most of us or all of us have experienced lockdowns and uh, uh, border restrictions, uh, then the issue of controlling borders is becoming uh, normal and it's no longer a taboo. Uh, and therefore, you won't be considered a nationalist or xenophobic just because you argue that border, border controls uh, are necessary. And in a way, that, that could pave the, pave the way for a calmer uh, debate about migration uh, in Europe. If it's about managing uh, migration through uh, border control uh, and not necessarily about restricting it. But then at the same time, obviously, uh, the normalization of, of border control uh, presents uh, presents risks, and uh, this is seen in the criticism that the, the latest uh, proposal by the by the European uh, Commission has uh, has provoked. Uh, for example, the fact that it uh, uh, suggests that uh, borders, external borders, should be uh, protected more, uh, is seen as as uh, coming at the cost uh, of asylum and human human rights safeguards. Uh, for example, encouraging uh, pr probably pushbacks of, uh, of uh, uh, migrants. And therefore, uh, what, what, what is an opportunity so also, also presents uh, risk. And let, let me uh, at, at the end flag that the context is still very flat, fragile. We are not in a post-COVID uh, COVID era. We, we cannot simply analyze how COVID uh, crisis uh, worked and uh, draw lessons from, from it because we are still in the middle uh, of it. And uh, if, if something is, uh, is fragile, it's, it, it's, uh, it's public opinion in particular, because uh, it, it is still very vulnerable to changes we, which we might see. And if, if I imagine that, for example, we see a persistent pandemic, that it's not over uh, shortly, and that uh, a new refugee challenge uh, uh, is, is there for, 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 for Europeans to respond to. Uh, then I can easily imagine that it could become this bargain for, for, uh, for, for politicians who choose to consolidate their political power uh, on, on the worst cent around the worst sentiments. And it would also be a test uh, as to how the link between borders, migrants and help uh, is being constructed. Uh, lucky, luckily, we are not there yet, in my, in my opinion, but with the upcoming elections in in the Netherlands in, in, or in general, Germany, and with a generally fragile situation uh, in, in regards to, to the pandemic, I think we, uh, we need to be vigilant. Thank you, Pavel. Um, so we'll now uh, go to the Q&A session. Um, but first, uh, I, I would have a few questions if I, if I can start. Um, so uh, Shoshana and Celine, I really like the, the third approach and the, like the third regime that you mentioned. Um, and I think that maybe uh, that would be worth uh, you having a bit more time to talk about it because how, I mean, how do you, how do you see the EU taking up this approach and maybe um, um, preferring it to the other two? And, and also um, to Bashak maybe, uh, I, I would, like you to, to, to talk about the, the new pact for migration and, and asylum that has been uh, proposed by the, e, the, the European Commission last week. Um, maybe you could talk about the, the potential impacts of it on the EU Turkey relations, if, uh, if that's possible. So maybe up to uh, uh, Shoshana or Celine, if you want to start with them. Um, and then we can open, so you can either write uh, your question on the chat box or let us know that you want to intervene. Yeah, just to begin very briefly, um, I think that absolutely, obviously, this is the regime. Excuse me. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think that this is a very promising regime, you know, for migrants and for European citizens alike. Um, so I think that this is something that's absolutely necessary. And I wonder if 
you know this crisis this moment of crisis imagine we can you know sometimes we can speak about you know a moment of change and could this be the same having said that i think that we often have a tendency to overemphasize change and crisis right often what we see is more of the same uh so not really new practices uh, that seem to be happening. And this is certainly something that we've seen with the way that, in which migration has been governed. Uh, so we see perhaps more intensity of control policies. We see kind of a different way, you know, we both spoke about this in, in the presentation, a different kind of articulation of the dangerous migrant and the deserving migrant. Yet we still see this division going on. So we still see this dividing process in which you know, migration continues to be securitized. So what do we need in order to get towards this new regime? You know, ultimately, and, you know, scholars have been calling for this for a long time, we need a paradigm shift. So we need to stop uh, thinking about migration as a problem or a threat. You know, thinking about migration, that is something that is, you know, perhaps doing away with the term altogether, because I think the term has become so politicized that, it's not a useful term. So just thinking about mobility through a different lens. Uh, so I think that this is absolutely essential for, for moving towards a different regime. That's why I pass to Selim. Um, yeah, thanks, Shoshana. Yeah, I think I, I sort of, uh, you know, joined Shoshana in thinking that I personally don't see the, you know, EU taking it on board as a sort of natural process or uh, but rather, uh, uh, Shoshana mentioned sort of uh, paradigm shifts in academic terms. I think we can't also speak about this issue outside politics. And if we go back to this example I used in conclusion about how a particular reading of collective health brought about changes and improvement in uh, working class conditions, of course, this also could have happened in a vacuum, in a political vacuum. I mean. So this was tagged along an organized working class movement and certain type of class politics. So similarly, I don't think we can imagine, you know, pushing forward a more including vision based uh, on the recognition of the evaluation of people beyond the particular regime that we presented uh, for their usefulness for specific purposes without imagining and thinking together about how to organize politically <laughs> around those issues. Um, so obviously that's a vast program. I'm not here to <laughs> discuss the specifics, but it's about a paradigm shift in terms of not depoliticizing and you know, imagining that such changes can happen outside of politics, but perhaps depoliticizing from a certain approach, as Prashana was saying, and infusing new forms of solidarity you know, political communities and, and meanings around this issue. So whether this particular crisis could be a trigger for such thing is obviously just an open question. As Pavel was saying, we're still very much in that situation. We don't necessarily have the time distance to, to bring out those conclusions, but that's certainly something we can sort of try and discuss and, you know, <laughs> and, and push forward. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, Bashak, uh, do you want to come in? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's a great question. And I was actually thinking about Shoshana's call for a paradigm shift. And if this pact is an answer to that call, I don't think so. <laughs> but is it at least um, rational, proper, logical migration management method as claimed by the um, uh, vice president of the commission, Skinas? I am not sure about that either, but we'll see. I mean, I'll let you decide on that. So it's basically, as he describes it, uh, this rest, this uh, pact rests on three floors. The first floor is a very strong external dimension with partnerships with countries of origin and transit. Uh, and the, these kind of partnerships entail supporting them uh, economically and strengthening both their border management uh, border security, but also uh, their fight against smuggling. Uh, so increasing that kind of capacity. The second floor is a robust management of external borders, uh, all arrivals being subject to an immediate checks and all those unlikely to receive asylum in terms of country origin to be directed to fast tracked asylum process. And, um, and if 
uh, they do not grant this quickly return uh, to be returned to where they came from or country of origin. And the third floor is in within the EU and that's the only solidarity part <laughs> in the EU member states being in solidarity. It's a permanent solidarity system where in addition to resettlement, uh, you know, countries pledging for resettlement, they can also sponsor I mean, if they don't want to, to resettle, like uh, in the case of many Central and East European countries, then uh, doing a return sponsorship. So um, basically uh, helping out with the process of return and uh, maybe reintegration back to the, in the country of origin. So, um, uh, I do have major concerns about uh, the um, the entire uh, spon return sponsorship system because even though it's many of these and there is a part about voluntary returns and there's a huge discussion as to how voluntary these returns are, uh, the expedited system may create um, situations where uh, asylum decisions are taken too quickly and then this would create a heavy load on the appeals and then you know it wouldn't change anything in the end so what does that mean in terms of policy effectiveness uh, we don't know uh, but uh, but the it definitely sounds good the return sponsorship and alleviates I believe some of the uh, concerns about uh, irregular migration. Um, with regards to, I mean, definitely with regards to the external dimension, strong and external dimension and collaborations with the countries of origin and countries of transit, this does provide opportunities for collaborations with countries like Turkey. Uh, but uh, what we uh, miss I mean, what we lack with these collaborations is a long-term uh, time span rather than a short-term, uh, yeah, let me return these people and give you some money in return, uh, more like ways of supporting um, local integration of these uh, people uh, or assisted returns and um, with uh, assisted support. Uh, there and uh, but still uh, the issue of sustainability is not addressed and maybe in the um, collaborations with the countries we will see this materialize. Uh, but I believe that you know giving money for um, certain things um, is possible, but it is costly on EU taxpayers also. Whereas you know what I suggested, the preferential trade agreements are not that costly at all, and everybody wins out of them. Um, but we'll see if it'll uh, converge into something like that. With regards to returns, this would have major uh, implications for the relations with Turkey. We will definitely, because if it uh, foresees an expedited return process, uh, currently the number of returns from EU to Turkey uh, the, of the irregular migrants has not been uh, great in numbers and they could be temporarily accommodated uh, at their return centers and be sent back or locally integrated. Uh, but if these numbers increase, uh, different uh, governance challenges uh, will be faced in the country. Thank you. I hope this was it. And in the room, for the room, <laughs> so maybe we can ask this one. Thank you, Matthew. I had a, a question for it. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand what you meant about this idea of um, a crisis as an opportunity for the normalization of border control. So, I mean, what, what are you, what specifically are you speaking about from which perspective? And in my perspective, border control is very much normalized already and has been, in fact, in fact part of the DNA of the European project, sadly, for decades. So, as Shoshana, we tend to see that there is much less change, perhaps that's what we think, but rather an ex ex exacerbation of already existing dynamics. So yeah, in you know, in light of those comments, can you re-explain perhaps what you meant? Yeah, of course. I mostly mostly meant the the, the tension from border control is is uh, is taken uh, is taken down a bit, uh, so that it's so it's not uh, associated uh, with with naturally xenophobic or uh, or nationalist uh, positions. So, but uh, but you 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 have observed this. Uh, uh, um, 
this discussion profoundly, so so uh, uh, you know. But in the night that uh, um, that <laughs> that this this is not uh, a radical change, but probably uh, uh, just uh, some change. Let me let me say that but as as I said, I, I'm focusing on public opinion. I'm not expert in migration policy necessarily, and I I've uh, I've recognized three uh, possible. Solutions or not solutions, to battle, uh, but pathways that that you have identified, and I can clearly understand that there is a, a good solution, which is the what you call univer universalist one, uh, whose signs you can see in how the Italian government or the Portuguese government are uh, have been acting recently. I also can easily uh, identify a, 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 an ugly uh, solution, which is the one. Uh, for example, uh, promoted by, by Matteo Salvini, where uh, where uh, this uh, link between migrants and viruses and health is is is, is, is constructed. But then the, the the first solution, which which at the beginning was 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 discussed by uh, by Shoshana, as with uh, with uh, protection of lives, like uh, protection of borders as protection of lives. Uh, I I understand that I I see many of its signs in the current approach of of. Uh, uh, of, of the European Commission, but I cannot say uh, whether whether something which is in between beautiful and ugly is is, is actually good or is it uh, uh, is it bad. Let me add to this discussion to make it uh, a little bit more complicated. Still, uh, that uh, we are discussing the pros and cons of different uh, way of shaping migration policy. But I, what I see from from our analysis of of, uh, of European co cooperation is that. Migration policy is uh, inevit inevitably linked to all the uh, to several other aspects which are currently on the uh, EU agenda, and uh, in most of those aspects, the, the word solidarity is used and abused. So uh, there is solidarity in the financial realm, where, which uh, the, the the July comp uh, agreement by by the Council uh, it, it re represent there has been. Solidarity in the health area throughout the crisis, probably not just at the beginning, but then we've seen many uh, signs of it. Um, uh, and now, with, with with regards to migration policy, there is this talk about permanent, effective, uh, constant solidarity. Although we have to ask ourselves whether uh, solidarity actually can be made compulsory. Um, and and uh, in other areas, uh, like foreign policy. Uh, or, or rule of law and values, solidarity is also uh, a, 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 an important issue. So, in a way, what, how I, I think that how the the, the EU uh, policy will get shape over the next couple of weeks and, and months will also depend on on, on, on on how the all of these other elements of the puzzle will uh, will, will get uh, uh, solved. And because for the uh, European Commission's proposal to then effectively uh, work, uh, the, co the collaborative approach from, from member states will be necessary and they, they face uh, the uh, opposing incentives in those ar other area areas as to whether to cooperate or not. I responded to your question at the beginning and then I moved to something completely different. Well, I guess just, just to add, I mean, and at the same time as I quickly mentioned, when you have grassroots forms of solidarity, so non-state oriented and non that imagination of solidarity as a European to European practice, we see very heavy practices of criminalization and legalization. So solidarity can be used in an exclusionary manner as well. And sure. its own sure. realm. And it's I'm just different. saying that yeah. in, in the EU discussions that concept of solidarity is used and abused. Yeah. And I, I, I get the point that it's not necessarily solidarity, which is uh, thought of as an interhuman one or, or to, as crossing the EU borders. Right. Um, are, there, are there any questions from the audience? Do, do anyone want to have a question? Okay, do you, do you want to add anything here in the room? Um, are there I mean, things that you would have wanted to say? Yeah. <laughs> it's getting difficult. Uh, it's just since I have this opportunity, uh, because I'm not uh, you know, at all a scholar of uh, public opinion, 
And I'm interested in this way that you connect politics, opinion, and policies. So you've spoken about you know different ways in which they sort of shape each other. For me, it's hard to think about public opinion outside of you know paradigms, and those are connected to politics. So can you just tell us how you conceptualize those three things, and maybe as I'm not a scholar of public opinion. Okay. <laughs> Oh, well, how do you assess uh, public opinion on migration, for example, independently of broader political discourses that shape how people think about migration? Uh, the kind of thing we were discussing with Shoshana, because for me it's hard to distinguish where one stops and the other is. Which one stops? Well, you know, what, what do you see as paradigms that exist in politics and are pushed forward by actors, politicians, the media? And where does public opinion stand in relation to this? So, how do you evaluate both and separate them in the way that you sort of think? Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not easy. I'm I'm not saying that I can uh, become a completely neutral observer of uh, of uh, all those phenomena, but uh, I and and of course the way you ask questions in the survey also is is biased by by, by paradigms that you that you are mm -hmm. subject. Uh, but still, what 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 uh, the way I, I see uh, public opinion work useful uh, is 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 in the sense that uh, um, uh, that this helps you uncover the 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 abuses of, of public opinion by other actors, and therefore, if you mm -hmm. if you want to, uh, if you have an agenda for for the European Union to to have a more universalist approach to uh, to, uh, to to migration, and it's worth uh, deconstructing how uh, other actors are simplifying the, what they claim to see in the public opinion uh, as a support for their uh, uh, approaches, which are which uh, earlier I described, described as ugly. Uh, so, but but uh, this is uh, this is not. Not a neutral positions that you that you are uh, assuming, and you are doing it uh, pretty much uh, uh, while at the same time navigating a, 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 a boat on, on a, um, in a cloudy weather. So you, you don't have the luxury to to, to uh, see everything neatly and uh, and clearly. Inevitably, you are engaged in a battle of narratives. I don't know if that's a response to the, uh, your question. I, I was. If I can ask uh, something, but uh, it, it's not a revenge. It's just uh, <laughs> just out of out, out of curiosity because I I'm, I'm really uh, the the pact proposed by European Commission is some is something new and uh, and something which which uh, on, on, on on which opinions are, are still fresh. I, I was wondering how uh, how you see uh, that and in particular with respect to. Um, divisions within the European uh, Union between different countries. In, in ECFR, we have another project. I'm, I'm, I'm also engaged in it. It's, it's called Coalition Explorer. And uh, we did our latest round of it in March and April this year. So just when the pandemic was starting. Back then, we, we've seen that uh, migration was one of the two uh, most important policy areas flagged by policy professionals who participate in the survey. So it's not a public survey, it's a survey, survey among uh, policy uh, professionals. So next to fiscal uh, policy and Eurozone governance, it was migration, which was still seen as, as, as one of the two uh, biggest priority areas for governments of 27 European uh, countries. And it was number one priority for governments of Italy, Greece, Cyprus, and Malta. As well as Hungary, of course, uh, they the, these governments tend to cooperate with, in different groupings with uh, with, with one, one another, and most notably, one can identify two clusters. There, there is uh, on the one hand uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Cyprus, Greece, uh, uh, who say that they uh, uh, see another each each others as. Uh, partners in, on, on the issue of migration, whereas for, for Hungary, it's mostly other Visegrad four countries plus Austria uh, that they see as uh, partners. And therefore, I, I just wondered to what extent uh, uh, I, I see the, the current proposal as a way to, to get also those most uh, skeptical governments, like those of Central and Eastern Europe, on board. But do you think as it's as realistic uh, as to whether 
taking on board could happen? And do you see uh, uh, risks? Rather, do you see that there are more benefits or uh, or or disadvantages of actually seeking such a compromise between different positions? Yeah, maybe Bashak. Yeah, Bashak, do, do you want to say something in response to Pavel's question? Um, sure. Uh, I did have a question for Pavel too. Maybe I can take that opportunity to ask him that question afterwards too. Um, well, um, as I said in the beginning, I don't think it's a paradigm shift or, um, you know, but one of the concerns with the EU Turkey deal has always been the um, too much compromise against. Uh, the Turkish government, the president, um, but um, this kind of an approach, uh, I mean, this again, the three-tiered approach requires the, those kind of compromises to the third parties because it still tries to externalize the problem heavily. Uh, so as long as there is a focus on this, it's really hard um, I mean, it's really hard not to be in a cooperation with uh, a leader that you do not particularly, you're not fond of, let's put it that way. And um, so in that regard, um, it's still, I feel like in terms of foreign policy, the EU is locking itself in a position, uh, in this position, because of its heavy emphasis on externalization of the issue. When it comes to, I mean, your question in terms, the specific question as to the uh, compromise, yes, it is a compromise. And um, I guess, I, as I said, I think the return sponsorship is something that can get the um, people on board, but um, the, the Eurosceptics or more populist leaders on board, uh, but again, still, that would require transfer of funds. And from what I remember, they're not also willing to transfer any funds. And uh, I don't know how they will approach to this issue. And again, the solidarity is called a permanent solidarity system. So it's not optional. It's either you're going to do resettlement or returns, whether or not they'll agree to this. Um, it's still... Um, suspicious, dubious, in my opinion. Uh, and again, I have major concerns about this, these returns and uh, the decision being made uh, fairly in such a short amount of time. My question to you is about um, the public opinion surveys, actually. Um, in the after, I mean, throughout COVID, there was uh, this discussion that, you know, this experience with um, lack of movement and also um, deprivation, potential um, deprivation of uh, livelihoods created a different sense of solidarity among different social classes, but also with migrants. And, you know, there is, I think, uh, sufficient reason to expect the public opinion to reflect the policy um, categorization duality of immigrant like strict borders to outside but you know for the immigrants inside liberal policies for those within the borders do you think um, were there any questions or did you come across any uh, surveys that looked into this aspect of attitudes towards existing migrants and how they have changed in the course of uh, the pandemic or whether or not we did see, I mean, because we did, we did see manifestations of this um, actual solidarity and um, with the creation of solidarity networks and uh, that help out migrants everywhere in Turkey, but in Belgium and Germany, uh, I'm sure in France too. So do, you, do, do we have a new group of people now with uh, due to their increased empathy have more positive attitudes towards migrants. So I'm looking for a similar lining here. Is, is there one? <laughs> Should I respond quickly? I, I haven't come up with, uh, come across any service which analyzed this subject, but I agree with you 100%. Uh, and it, it was actually one of our council members uh, uh, who wrote a, a, a great commentary saying that the, that the COVID-19 experience has some 
uh, ways of uh, pulling us uh, together, closer together, because we it's a shared experience, and it could indeed be constructed as a, as, a, as an experience which we also share with other uh, migrants, which which are already in Europe. But at the same time, there are many ways that this uh, this this crisis uh, is pulling us, uh, or this moment is is pulling us uh, apart. Most of all, because it's uh, easy to. Uh, to, to to try to look for scapegoats, uh, and there are always some actors who, who find, find a, an opportunity to uh, to do so. And I think that the jury is still out. W which of the forces will uh, will win? Uh, those pulling us together, or those pulling us uh, apart. But here, a, a, a big responsibility is on the part of all those who are engaged in the battle of narratives, which, which we mentioned earlier. Thanks. Do you have uh, anything else to say, or should we? Um, just a quick comment on on Paul's um, question, and coming back to your question from earlier too. Um, in terms of the pact, and when we speak about solidarity, and we speak about this universalist model, now I think there's a real problem in thinking about the pact in terms of solidarity, because once again, what we see is a lot of more of the same, right? A continuation of a lot of policies. So. You know, there's not actually that much new there. And what do we see in this respect? You know, when we use the term solidarity, we're using it here to speak about EU member state cooperation, right? So we're not really thinking, you know, so we've got to think about the object of that solidarity. So what's not coming into place here is solidarity towards migrants. So I think we also have to, you know, be critical about the way in which we think about this solidarity in place. Now, what I think would be an important way forward towards this universalist model is that we don't merely think about solidarity in terms of, for example, this notion of sharing the burden, uh, you know, but we, in terms of solidarity, and also solidarity towards migrants. So perhaps a policy that is more welcoming, uh, that treats uh, migrants and refugees, uh, you know, that respects their rights and their dignity and so forth. So I think that, you know, we have to, I think this is why this problem of solidarity I find problematic because it's not really a question of solidarity for me when we're still only really seeing exclusionary policies. Yeah, and I fully subscribe to that. And I, I feel that by the use of solidarity to every single domain in, in the EU right now, we are banalizing the concept and, and uh, going away from, from what uh, many of us believe solidarity should be about, uh, mainly having this interhuman aspect. And not just the one between member states, because the the, the the way solidarity is discussed right now in the EU has a lot of transactionalism, and, and transactionalism is, is, is difficult to mm. reconcile with solidarity. Yeah. yeah, and we've still, you know, this whole reform, there's nothing in it that is, you know, pushing towards any kind of shift in terms of solidarities towards migrants and refugees. You know, the only kind of vague direction we see there is the affirmation that search and rescue is a legal imperative, which is something that has already existed, but as we know, is being disrespected. So, you know, this is the only kind of point that is in, in, the, kind of, in the direction of solidarity. So I think that this is something that, that, that is an extreme problematic in the European policy, migration policy agenda. Thanks. Um, should we should we leave it here? I think we uh, we had a really in intense conversation, and so I want to thank you all for joining. Thank you, thank you, Bashak, for joining remotely. Uh, I think it worked quite well. I, I feel like the the, uh, the debate have have been lively. So we so this was the first round of our cycle of seminars, and we'll organize um, maybe two more. Uh, talking about climate, European uh, cooperation and migration. So we'll, uh, we will keep you posted and uh, thank you very much, very much to all of you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.